Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, we give a big thumbs up to the Iguanodon. And writer Andy Riley starts off on Crazy Gulf and we end up at the Wallace Line. Hello and welcome to Terrible Lizards. Now, patrons or patrons, whatever you like to call you, lovely people, some of them don't get any extra content. They just want to do the equivalent of sort of buying one of us half a coffee. Uh, so they, you can donate as little as, I think it's a dollar a month. But if you do do that, you are part of our Iguanodon thumbs up tier on Patreon. And that is what we know about the Iguanodon. We know a lot about the fact that they've got their thumbs up. What do they have their thumbs up, Dave? <laughs> but, uh, we're still PG, right? <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, I, well, so th- thumbs, I, I believe, will be coming up later in detail. But yeah, I- Iguanodon is one of those, and indeed the whole group of Iguanodontid, are one of those groups that I think a lot of people have heard of. It's a name which is very familiar. Well, it's got the word iguana in it. Who doesn't like an iguana? Well, true. Uh, But people don't actually know very much about them. They suffer, rather, from being uh, one of those groups that doesn't have anything particularly obvious going for it, which would drive people's interest. They got the spiky thumb, yes, and we will talk about that more later. But you think about, you know, the hadrosaurs, the duckbills, they've got the big crests on the back, the ceratopsians have the horns, the pachycephalosaurs have the domes, the ankylosaurs and stegosaurs have their armour and plates and things. Of course, all the carnivores have their teeth and claws, and some have some other the weird things going on as well and then the sauropods are massive and some of them are quite weird and then and then there's the iguanodons and a few others <laughs> there's some other groups like this as well and the and the ornithisians you know so our, our, our bird hipped herbivores that aren't actually very closely related to birds and it's like that they're, they're there it's hard to obviously point to someone and go you know the ones with or that look like because they're in in that regard they're a fairly generic herbivore but why does everybody know know them then because they are literally one of the first ones you learn and they begin with an i so they're really useful in terms of games of alphabet games yeah as for kids um i think it's probably just because they're so old uh in discovery sense so iguanodon was the second name dinosaur ever um coming hot on the heels of megalosaurus and there's i think there's a bit of contention around quite how that happened and it suggested so the megalosaurus was named by a very famous researcher called uh William Buckland, who was at the time a dean and then later became a canon. He was he was really quite big in the church. Um, Iguanodon was named by uh, Gideon Mantell, who was a doctor and amateur naturalist and paleontologist. And Buckland and and Mantell were in conversation. And I, if I remember correctly, there was at least you know Buckland said something like, "Oh, well, you know, I think I think you need to do a little bit more work on your paper," and then got his one out or something. <laughs> it's a bit cheeky. Um, no, nothing too blatant or too, or too awful uh, but I believe there's a little bit but anyway the, those two names came out very very close to each other and so we had the first carnivorous dinosaur and the first herbivorous dinosaur though neither was called a dinosaur at that time that name had not been created and their relationship to each other was not known um, but I think that's going to be a big part of it and Megalosaurus was extremely incomplete um, Iguanodon was originally named just off a couple of teeth but it was rapidly a fairly big slab was found it's called the Maidstone slab and it's on display at the Natural History Museum, and I definitely said that later. Um, uh, you know, so we had a fairly good animal quite quickly, and even though there was a huge amount of contention over exactly how this re- got reconstructed, and you've got the famous rhino-like things at Crystal Palace, and that- you know, you can see the one at Crystal Palace with the thumb spike on its nose. Right, um, and that, but that that came from that slab because um, it's only when you've got a complete hand with the spike there it becomes obvious where it actually sits. But unlike Megalosaurus, where we had a bit of lower jaw and a couple of vertebrae and a bit of pelvis, and I think that was about it initially. With the Maidstone slab, you had quite a few teeth. Um, you've got quite a few vertebrae. You've got most of a leg, bits of arm. You know, there's quite a lot of animal there. But you know, by even modern standards, you look at that and go, "That's a pretty good specimen." There are, you know, it, no, you haven't got a 
complete skull and a complete legs and tail, but there's a good amount of animal there. And so Iguanodon, I think, very rapidly became, I wouldn't necessarily say fixed in the public's imagination because I don't have a great idea of the Victorian mindset. I certainly don't. But it, it's, you know, it's a name which would have resonated. It's a name which is around very early at the point of this peak discovery of plesiosaurs and pliosaurs and the first pterosaurs and other things like this coming to prominence. And there it is, Iguanodon. And of course, being British as well, at a time with, you know, everything being very empire and all the rest of it, the, the first dinosaur that we had a even half decent idea of what it looked like was Iguanodon. And so even though now we might say it's not particularly exciting <laughs> in terms of it doesn't have a great big fin on its back or it doesn't have super long arms or super weird jaws or anything like this it's one of the originals it's been around it may not be great but it's the one everyone knows and I, I think that's a large part of it so what about its biology then what do we know about you know when it lived where it lived what it did when it was alive yeah so, so the first thing it's probably worth saying regards to that so I've said iguana dance a couple of times talked about like the wider group oh of course because there's more than one yeah so there you know as usual there are a whole bunch of animals I mean even so that's worth kind of pointing out today you know even things we have today like the platypus there is only one platypus the aardvark there is only one aardvark well alive right now yes but actually you know there are fossil aardvarks there are fossil platypus so it, you know you, it's almost impossible to get an, a, a species which is very distinctive and not part of a bigger evolutionary pattern including uh, humans in, well including humans yeah um and you know iguanodon iguanodon is is no exception to this and there are a whole bunch of them um but it is also we need to clarify here that iguanodonts or iguanodontians are a grade g-r-a-d-e and not a clade c-l-a-d-e what is a grade and what is a clade yes which is which is where, strange enough where we go i'm useful we, so we we've, we've talked about this this issue before with the sauropods there's a bigger group called sauropodomorphs and within that is the group that most people are familiar with, which is the sauropods, which are the big bodied, long neck, long tail, Diplodocus, Spadosaurus, Brachiosaurus, and all of that. And then the group that kind of comes before that are often called the prosauropods, and that is a good common name for them. But it's wrong. Well, right, but, it, but it's, <laughs> it's kind of wrong. And indeed, dinosaurs as a whole, excluding birds, would actually fall into the same thing at a much, much bigger scale. So in terms of evolution and in terms of of um, correct naming of things in, in taxonomy and, and just in biology general, what we're interested in are evolutionary groups. In other words, we can draw a big family tree of whatever it is we're looking at and you could draw, a, you know, effectively draw a line on that and talk about everything that came on that lineage after that point. So we could we could take a big phylogeny of all reptiles, all reptiles including dinosaurs and lizards and snakes and crocodiles and plesiosaurs and loads and loads of other things and you could go on to a picture of that that, and you could draw a line and say this is where birds started and everything that evolved from that little point and that group and branched out into all the tens of thousands of species that are all birds and everything else is not a bird. So a bit like you could look at all the different breeds of dogs in the world and all the different breeds of coyotes and that sort of thing and go back and find a common wolf back in the past. Yeah, the technical phrase which is used in the scientific literature is the most recent common ancestor and all its descendants so that's the idea so if you if you've got a big thing of birds and you go okay there's ostriches over here and there's ducks over here and there's finches. turkeys and there's hummingbirds and finches and hawks and flamingos and da, da 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 and trace their evolutionary history back you will eventually meet at some point a sparrow all of those things <laughs> me and indeed a whole bunch of fossil birds as well and that is the most recent common answer it is a common ancestor to all of those things it is the most recent one because obviously in theory you could go back to an amoeba and go ha that's a co that's a common ancestor so it's the most recent common answer and then all of their descendants that is a clade and so okay. birds are a clade and theropods are a clade and tyrannosaurs are a clade and dromaeosaurs are a clade and owls are a clade but a grade is basically that 
but excluding something. And so dinosaurs in the colloquial sense and in the way we use it in this podcast is actually a grade because it's all dinosaurs except birds. Mm. So there, there's an except. So we've got some of the evolutionary history, but not all of it. And that's the same with iguanodonts. So there is a branch of the Ornithischian diversity, which if you talked about the names that people are familiar with, includes all the hadrosaurs, so all the duck bills. So things like Parasaurolophus and Hadrosaurus and um, Edmontosaurus and some very common things, and Iguanodon and a few others. But if you draw a kind of family tree of that, the hadrosaurs are derived from a group which are very close to the Iguanodons. So it's not like there's one branch and that's the Iguanodons and there's another branch and that's the hadrosaurs. What you've got is a whole bunch of little branches of various different things which collectively we call the Iguanodons and then the hadrosaurs come off them. This is infinitely easier on a piece of paper than it is to do it in conversation but I hope people follow that. I'm just trying to think of like you know if we could explain this in terms of branches off a motorway into towns. I think well the motorway would work in terms of if you looked at the motorway as evolutionary history and each junction each numbered junction is you know branching off and it could just be one species or it could be a whole little bunch of separate species if it branches into little A roads. What we would normally do is we would say everything beyond this point is what we're talking about. So we're we're, we're at everything the very, beyond Swindon. We're at the very yeah we're at the very very start of the motorway and we want to talk about everything all the roads that branch from this motorway. And if you say okay everything from junction one up everything from junction two up everything from junction twenty seven up that's all relatively easy to follow. What we're effectively doing here is we're saying everything from junction five to junction twenty four. So we're not including the stuff that comes later even though it is on this same big road and therefore has a big shared history with it we're just talking about this middle section so that's what iguanodonts are basically they're a little artificial in terms of their evolutionary history but they're very useful to talk about so yes in the grand scheme of things birds are truly dinosaurs but actually for the point of view of people like me and indeed hopefully the people listening it's actually very useful to talk about dinosaurs as those extinct things in the mesozoic that didn't fly not what's on your bird feeder Right. Birds might be dinosaurs, but it's a useful terminology to not include them. And it's the same here. Iguanodonts are not a true evolutionary group, because although they have a single shared ancestor, we're artificially excluding the hadrosaurs when we're discussing them. But they are all very similar to each other, and they are distinct from hadrosaurs in some key ways, so it is very useful to talk about them as a group. So I guess this is a way of recognising that we are artificially excluding some things which in an evolutionary sense makes us bad biologists but it is a very useful thing to do and therefore there is no harm in doing it provided we recognise that that's what we're doing and also if any of us remember because we talked about it now five minutes ago and I've forgotten the difference we'd look at the difference between a grade and a clade we're learning yeah so iguanodonts would be a grade and your prosauropods would be a grade and indeed dinosaurs excluding birds would be a grade cool but dinosaurs including birds is a clade a clade yeah, a true evolutionary group. Cool. So where did iguanodons live? So we've got them in a bunch of places. They are actually really quite common in Europe. There's lots of stuff in the UK, uh, Belgium, France, um, and some other bits. Uh, there's some really nice ones from Africa. There's a really nice one from Italy. Uh, there's stuff in North America. Uh, I think there's stuff in China, though I can't immediately think of an example off the top of my head. I'd be surprised if they weren't. Um, I can't think of any in the southern continents. Um, that doesn't mean they weren't there, but I can't immediately think of any in South America or Australia. Asia. Um, okay. uh, uh, Africa includes one of arguably the most interesting and one of the kind of most famous outside of Iguanodon, which is a thing called Uranosaurus. O U R A N O. And Uranosaurus is really neat because it's got a giant sail back. So people are probably familiar with it, have heard of Spinosaurus. Well, Uranosaurus basically has the same thing going along its back and lived in a similar time and place. So there have been hints that this is some kind of shared um, ecological drive the sail backness evolved into completely different groups in the same place at the same time and that isn't the same uh, I remember from ages ago we talked about um, the, the different types of breeding and this isn't the ones which didn't lay eggs that were like almost like mammals that, but didn't they have a sail are you thinking of Dimetrodon I, I think I'm thinking of Dimetrodon I think you're thinking of synapsids and we're, we're, we're back on so yeah Ignorancy. Dimetrodon the, the classic 
comes in a pack of toy dinosaurs but lived outside the Mesozoic and is closer to mammals than reptiles. That's what I was thinking of, and that is not a... a you... That's Iranosaurus. At- Iranosaurus. <laughs> um, Iranu Uvavu. Yeah, that's going to really throw the Americans or non-Brits. And fr- frankly, half of the Brits are going to be confused. Yes, it's a, it's a. I, I think there should be an Uvavasaurus to go with an Uranusaurus. I think that would be great. I always thought it was Iranu spelled with an I. I suppose. Yeah. I remember you could get a mug with Iranu and Uvavu on them, so they ha- they are written down somewhere officially. If you don't know what we're talking about, um, they're members of the royal family. So, uh, <laughs> or some sort and, of tea, and definitely not a surrealist game show. <laughs> that used to be on 20 years ago. Big peanuts! Izzy said Phil 20 minutes and I've spent all of that explaining grades and clades and not talking about Iguanodon. So, yeah, so they're a group of basically early Cretaceous, large-bodied herbivores. And remember at this time, in a lot of places, the sauropods weren't doing very well and we didn't have very many sauropods. Um, And the hadrosaurs weren't around yet. And the ceratopsians were really quite small and piddly, which meant that aside from a few armoured dinosaurs, these were some of the biggest herbivores around. And yeah, a big arrival Iguanosaurus is a big animal. Um, that's one of the biggest iguanodonts. Um, it's going to be, I'm trying to think about two and a half, three meters to the hips. So, you know, a few tons, elephant sized. But given how big sauropods got before, and given that we have, you know, titanic hadrosaurs and titanic ceratopsians that are, you know, five to ten tons plus coming later, it's fairly moderately sized. Um, where they're found, they tend to turn up in decent numbers. Um, so famously, there's this Belgian coal mine, which produced huge amounts of iguanodon, which originally was regarded as being some giant single mass mortality, and a huge herd had died there, and now actually it looks like it's half a dozen different deposits of various times. Still, they, they were probably around in good numbers. I wouldn't be at all surprised if lots of them did live in groups, though, as I think we talked about before, the, the idea of social structures is often, I think, gross, grossly exaggerated in dinosaurs, mm. or rather stated with misplaced confidence I, th- I think they were perfectly capable of forming these big social complicated groups whether or not they did the, the evidence is you know really not well known and in some ways they're fairly basic in that again they, they lack a lot of this elaboration it, Iranosaurus being a very notable exception they've got a fairly hadrosaur like head so they've got l- these big rows of teeth that are lined up and very good for chewing chewing isn't quite the right word oral processing, oral is, the, processing. is the preferred terminology Mm. Well, because chewing kind of implies, you know, this this almost circular side motion, which they're not capable of. Oh, so they'd have been like a duck. So they're just going, no, 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 no. Yeah, they, yeah they, they, they don't have lateral movement of the jaw. So they're just going up and down. Oh, but they sad. would be doing a lot of damage to the plant matter by doing multiple different bites. But yeah, and they, they were definitely, definitely herbivorous. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you just take an iguanodon head and you just take a hadrosaur head, if you didn't know much about their biology you would see just how similar they are I mean obviously there's some specialisations and evolutionary changes going on but at a fundamental level they're really quite similar because they're doing the same thing in the same way Did they have their eyes to the side like modern herbivores compared to their eyes facing forward? Is that a, a mammal thing? Yeah, no it's not exclusively mammalian it's it's quite normal so yeah there's, there's this um, well there's, it's become a meme so you've seen things there has been a meme online of X animal has forward facing eyes therefore it's a predator and the joke being that it's something like E.T. you know E.T. in the movie has really forward facing eyes and so E.T. is actually secretly a predator ha ha isn't that funny Um, and while there is obviously a there is a truth to that it also inevitably squashes over some details so predators in general have more forward facing eyes because they're almost yeah almost inevitably going to have to run after and catch some Something, or jump out at something. Either way, they need to judge their distance very accurately. If both your eyes face forward, you have, uh, you know, um, binocular vision. That's really good because you've got a space between your eyes and that allows you to judge distances very effectively. If you if you don't understand that, do something like close an eye and then try and pick up a cup and it's actually quite hard to get the exact distance just right. You'll tend to tip it over or, or grasp short. Yeah, we are not liable for any damage or messes you make to cups or carpets. <laughs> yes, or broken 
looking glass yeah. or all the rest. Herbivores tend to have their eyes on their sides because they're much more interested in predators sneaking up on them. And therefore, having your eye closer to the side means you can see sideways and even to a degree behind you, depending on how big your eye bulges. So there is a fairly fundamental split of predators look forwards and herbivores look sideways, but there are some huge exceptions. So some predators, or indeed lots of very small predators, are also eaten by other things. So there's a trade-off between them making sure that they catch food, but also not being caught by something bigger. And the other big ones is basically anything that runs and climbs and jumps, uh, in particular primates. So, you know, almost all apes and monkeys have really forward-facing eyes, even if they're completely herbivorous, because it's the same fundamental problem. If when you're up a very big tree and you're going to jump from this tree into that tree... (laughs) Um, if you misjudge that distance and plummet 20 metres into the ground, th- there is a strong uh, evolutionary selective pressure against this phenomenon. But squirrels seem to manage it, but I suppose they've got quite poppy-outy eyes, don't they, squirrels? Yeah, Especially and so squeezing. this is where eye bulge also mm. kind of comes in. Um, and, and birds can do different things. So things like, you know, you will see things like chickens will twist their head left and right, mm. and that is helping them get a better judgment. Even animals that do have excellent eyesight, you know, owls do that, like, head-bobbing thing. It also makes, makes them look quite dismissive yes it does but anyway you know there there are these compromises involved um one thing i will say which is directly related to that is dinosaurs are often illustrated with their eyes completely wrong and it drives me bananas particularly the carnivores have we not sure we've talked about this before because i moan about it all the time i mean you you sort of i think you said that they've got two big eyebrows or something on t-rex okay we may have talked about this in the rex episode so if you if you picture your dinosaur skull obviously they are usually actually quite laterally flattened or quite boxy. They might be triangular in shape or they might be very square. But if you're looking at them top down, they're that kind of shape. If you look at them on the side, you know, you've got a big hole for the orbit um, and, you know, that's got a spar of bone either side. In fact, that, you know, that is what is delineating the presence of the orbit. A lot of artists and people who just draw dinosaurs love showing the skull. Of the, the, the common phrase is shrink-wrapped. So mm-hmm. that, that huge hole in the side of the skull in front of the eyeball is is very exposed you can like see it like the skin's been like someone stuck a vacuum up his nose and pulled the skin out and everything like sucks in like you suck in your cheeks and you can now see the edges they love showing them like that that's incorrect i think it's a bit of a trope from the 80s there was a, a trend in the 80s to draw really skinny dinosaurs um i think that's partly survived because people want to reflect the underlying skull anatomy and so if you're drawing a dinosaur with a weird skull if you flesh it all out you can't see the skull and I want people to know what skull I was drawing and that's the skull I based it on I want to show that I've done the anatomy and I'm an expert yeah, I'm not making this up done it right yeah, yeah. Uh, and and as a result of that they actually tend to exaggerate it and then and you end up with yeah this like starved shrink look um, but as part of that what they also tend to do is set the eyeball deep in the skull so that in particular the bar that sits in front of the eye is actually called the lacrimal because because it's where the tear ducts would go. Um, so the lacrimal bone, the lacrimal bar, the, the eyeball is almost like behind it. So if you were, you know, if you were face to face with this, with a theropod in particular, and you were looking up its slightly triangular head, what you'd expect to see is two big eyeballs facing you. Now they are, but they're stuck so deep in the head that <laughs> half the pupil would be hidden. And of course, when you draw the dinosaur side on, it doesn't look so bad. But if you mentally rotate that skull, and so, or the head so that you were looking at it you'd realise that its eyes are sunk deep into its head and animals don't have eyes sunk deep into their head in general and then the pupils of the, the lenses often actually bulge enormously look at close up photos of things like giraffe and um, goats head on get get a good photo and don't don't just go oh it's a photo i mean look at it really look and you'll suddenly realize and it's it's one of those i think like face two two faces in a vase like optical illusions that you like suddenly see it and you're like bloody hell their eyes stick out a mile <laughs> it's, and, it, it's, and it's almost like they're about to fall out <laughs> yeah it's, it's absolute. it's actually quite weird and quite horrible just how much these eyes pop out of their skulls 
that's really quite common. So yeah, the, having these eyeballs like deep in the head is not natural at all, and it totally changes how they would see things. Go back to your original question. Yes, iguanodons generally have their eyes on the sides of their heads, as do almost all herbivorous dinosaurs, for that general reason. These are herbivores, they're being predated on, they really want to make sure that there is someone not coming up behind them, and that is far more important than judging quite where that leaf is when you're trying to bite it. Mm. So, we know we know where they were, we know that they were herbivorous. Do we know anything else about them? I mean, you mentioned groups and we can't really know say what too, they were up to. Say too much, yeah. Um, well, the, one other thing they're famous for is being eaten. Um, so the, <laughs> the, the well-known North American Aww. one is uh, Tenontosaurus. And Tenontosaurus is the one which is pictured being eaten constantly by Deinonychus. So Deinonychus is the what Jurassic Roman Park general. Velociraptor is probably Along with actually the based on. Yes. Um, so, yeah, no, that, that, that really was, you know, a metre and a half, two metres tall to the top of the head, really quite a large dromaeosaur. And famously, there is this mortality site with a Tenontosaurus skeleton and several Deinonychus skeletons together. Um, and as a result of this, basically every dinosaur book ever has um, Tenontosaurus being attacked by specifically a group, because there were more than one skeletons found, of Deinonychus. Um, and it's about the only available one. Uh, there's a paleo artist called John Conway, um, and John once did a picture, well, it, it actually became its own little thing, which we'll probably talk about one day, an idea called All Yesterdays. There's a book, if anyone knows it, go and check out the book, but this was the kind of genesis of that project was John did a slideshow at a paleontology conference of, like, rarely seen or alternate ideas in dinosaurs um and one of you know and it, it was some really weird and like over exaggerated things like a like a, a plesiosaur pretending to be a bottom feeding shark and having weird growths all over its skin so it could pretend to be like a coral reef and stuff like this and he, and he had all these like mad interpretations and then there's an and then one was just an iguanodon in a feet an iguanodontian in a field and everyone's staring at it going what what the hell is it like what's weird about that it's it's just a dinosaur and John goes this is Tenontosaurus and it's maybe the only illustration in the world of it not being eaten by Deinonychus because <laughs> it was the only time you ever saw Tenontosaurus was being eaten by a group of Deinonychus and it's a good point is that it's been totally overshadowed by this one single specimen and so it's it's now only known as the thing that was eaten by that other thing and of course it's it's a dinosaur it's perfectly interesting in its own right we've got quite a lot Tenontosaurus well, this is what I was about to ask is if you've got a lot of different... I mean, how often are you finding predation evidence on these skeletons? Is there a lot... I mean, skeletons, fossils, sorry. So, well, not, not very often. The Tenontosaurus one, so that's been... That thing has itself become debatable. So when it was first described, it was like, oh, this is clear evidence of pack hunting because there's multiple different Deinonychus and there was isolated teeth as well, suggesting shed teeth so they were feeding. And so the idea is there was this big battle and daddy daddy da And he's like, well that actually doesn't look very reasonable you know if a, if the standard biology of Deinonychus is every time we attack a big herbivore a couple of us get killed <laughs> that's not really a big long term strategy is it it depends how big your egg clutches are. If you're having well, thousands of eggs, <laughs> right? But it's, you, you can see you can see the kind of flaw in that argument. Um, uh, and there are other Tenontosaurus skeletons with bite marks attributed to Deinonychus, or at least an animal of about that size with about that tooth shape. It, it's Deinonychus or something very like it. So the idea that Deinonychus was killing and eating Tenontosaurus is fine. The idea that this was a classic that this you know this is the original origin of the pack hunting in Dromaeosaurs is this Tenontosaurus skeleton. And you're like, well, right. But again, you know, if everyone dies every time we try this on, this is very, very poor practice. And do we know how they died? Are they, did they die from injury or did they die? Well, I don't think there's any good evidence for that. And then that's also part of the problem is that, well, if this Tenontosaurus did kill them, wh where are the crushed bones or obvious disarticulations or, or, or fractures from, you know, a nice set of snapped ribs? And also, it's pretty hard to kill 
something. Um, well, <laughs> no, but, but, but no, but I, but I mean, and for it to die right there. Mm. So I, I saw a video the other day from South Africa of it, it's hard to tell because of the way the video cuts in because it's just a tourist group who spotted it. Basically, a, a, a lioness being tossed around by a big herd of buffalo, and I mean, like this animal is flying through the air. You know, obviously that is a big group of buffalo, and and yada yada yada, and the lion was probably alive at the start of it she's definitely dead halfway through the video whether she's still alive at the start i don't know some of the commentary from the people because there's obviously a, a game driver or someone like a guy talking about it and he said oh well i think he said something like well she's definitely gone now which kind of implies that they could see her moving earlier but even so you know this line just gets tossed around here there and everywhere and then eventually just like chucked in the edge of a lake and then the body just kind of sags but it's the point i'm making is like the tenontosaurus was found within like feet of these two deinonychus it's actually really quite hard to kill something instantly so that it drops dead right there. And also, you're going to want to play with it like those buffalo did. Bit of volleyball. Even if this was a giant fight where, like, 20 Dionychus piled on this Tenontosaurus, the odds that it killed two of them, and it killed them so outright that they dropped right there, right next to it, and they didn't crawl away or limp a bit further or just get dragged, or when the waves came in and buried them in mud, it didn't push them away, is basically nil. So is it more likely that they died further away and then the waves brought them in? I have to reread the description, though I don't think it, if I remember correctly, it doesn't really cover this in great detail, because I think people thought they knew what the interpretation was. Um, you also, I, I honestly, I just can't remember, but, you know, if people weren't thinking of that kind of information when they dug it up, and then people are doing that description much later, they may not have that information to play with. But yeah, I just think it's, it's an extraordinary coincidence that these two animals got killed killed and died right there and were buried right there. I mean, you just need to live in a slightly polluted place where there is trash in the water and dead things in the water and just look how it groups. Yeah. So when you have animals that have died and, you know, nothing's eaten, you know, nothing's eaten the bones and ripped them apart and they've been buried quickly in mud, it does look from a layman's point of view, well, yeah, because things tend to group together in where the water swirls and... Yep. And it tends to group things together and they all get buried together and that kind of makes sense but that's sad I, anyway we're sidestepping the main issue that we have about iguanodon and that is their hands and we um invited a very special man a brilliant writer an amazing cartoonist and just a generally lovely bloke he's called andy riley and here he is to ask dave a question this is the second dinosaur related activity i've done today Hooray. wow because what was the First this morning, related activity. by coincidence, this morning I had booked, because you can still do it in Tier 4, mm-hmm. I booked us onto the Dinosaur Safari Adventure Golf, just off the A1 near Borehamwood. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> because crazy golf courses count as, as golf. Oh, because they're outside, are so, they? So the government say that the, the you can do it. And I don't know if you would have entirely enjoyed it, because... Although it was a very well designed course in terms of the play, the labelling of the large fiberglass dinosaurs <laughs> was thoroughly substandard. So I, I've got a sneaking suspicion I've driven past this one. I'd have to, yeah. I'd have to check where it is. So there's, there's, it's on the A1. Yeah, but my, my knowledge of the road network is terrible. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, well, no, there, there's, there's London, two yeah. fairly big ones in London that I've driven. One, yes. one I've been to actually down in the southeast. Um, yeah. so it's on the way down there's one to Dover. The, there's, there's one on the North Circular. Yeah, and that's this, the one I'm this thinking one, of. Yeah, this this one is owned by the same people, but but further away. It's got a giant Diplodocus, which they ha- a really big one. It's about like fifty foot long, which they have managed to actually label as a Diplodocus. Well done. Uh, it's got a sign saying Utah Raptor with no Utah Raptor <laughs> in evidence. It's got. <laughs> Uh, Megalodon is, is two different dinosaurs are labelled as the Megalodon. The Ankylosaurus is correct. It's, it's all over the shop. Okay. All over the shop. So, so, so the one I've been to is, was genuinely quite impressive. Like, I've I've seen far worse models more recently yes. at <laughs> proper museums that should know better. And this is just a crazy golf course. And yeah, the, the other yeah. one that I've driven past on the North Circular... 
I can only because obviously I'm going quite fast on the on the major road, yeah. and you could just see a few things. But yeah, the two or three things you could see looked genuinely if, if good. I played that one in its first week of opening, and as I recall, there was a hole where you put the ball through a T Rex's mouth. Oh, lovely! That's what you want. I said that, and that's what you want. Yeah, that's, that's you an need easy a, a... hole though. To be fair, they've got the biggest mouth ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, but that wasn't that wasn't the actual hole hole. That oh, okay. was just. <laughs> part of the thing but dinosaurs i think do very well because they are one of the there's only about three things that crazy golf courses have themes of right yeah there's there's dinosaurs there's pirates and there's a sort of generic indiana jonesy one yeah i was going to say i've seen a kind of vague jungly one in bristol (laughs) yes none of them have a windmill of course but windmills are actually rarer than people think they are it's much more usual that you're going to put a ball through some sort of imitation mayan temple that a local builder knocked up (laughs) Anyway, this has got nothing to do with dinosaurs other than obviously we want the most accurate of all dinosaur um, crazy golf. Do you actually have a question for Dave, Mr. Riley? I do, I do, because I, I try to keep up with uh, dinosaur related business and I know about the KT boundary and all that kind of stuff. But one thing that I haven't heard about for years, and I wondered what the latest on it was, is the Iguanodon's hand. Yes. What's the what's the deal with the Iguanodon's hand at the moment? What's the de- um, well, so the first thing I'll say is that there should be something coming on this relatively soon because there's a PhD student at the Natural History Museum at the moment working on the hands and arms of various dinosaurs. And I know that they've yeah. been looking at... There's a really nice Iguanodontid uh, called... Mant- what used to be called Iguanodon is now called Mantellisaurus, so the British one. They've got a really nice skeleton at the Natural History Museum. That's something that they've deconstructed constructed and scanned and are doing sexy things with so i don't know what the results of any of their research is but in the next couple of years we should see the fruits of that research start coming through so hopefully there'll actually be some potentially exciting developments but i guess the the average iguanodon hand has kind of three things going for it uh, Ig- iguanodon and its relatives the iguanodon sids famously have a giant solid spike of bone which is basically the entire thumb and they always are shown in very um, Arthur Fonzarelli thumbs up poses <laughs> <laughs> with their nice spiky thumbs. Um, and but yeah, but their hands are actually really quite interesting because although that's the bit that almost everyone knows about or has heard about, they as I was trying to say, they they do kind of other interesting things. So they do walk on them. So they do have five fingers, which in, is unusual for some dinosaurs. I mean, we famously T Rex down to two, and a lot of the carnivorous dinosaurs have only two or three fingers but many of the herbivores had five and in the case of uh, iguanodon so they're basically walking on their three middle fingers and possibly their little finger to a degree and they have little hooves basically at the end their fifth finger so their little finger i've seen this argued about recently but i think it's probably still fairly true is for them more like our thumb in that it actually sits at a bit of an angle and therefore can fold across the palm in a way which obviously most animals can't do at all and so the idea is this gives them a bit of grip effectively if you put your hand backwards and have your thumb as your little finger then you could you know it sticks out at a bit of an angle and you could fold it in and that would allow you to grip stuff in the palm of the hand so that's actually really quite cool and i don't think there's pretty much anything else that has that as i say i know at least a couple researchers who think that that idea is really dodgy and that the finger couldn't fold that far but i think most people think that's probably true but then yeah the, the the bit that everyone knows is is the thumb spike and that is one which i think definitely needs reevaluation so every illustration you've ever seen of Iguanodon, almost every illustration you've ever seen of Iguanodon is it's in a kind of like wrestling match with an Allosaur or a Megalosaur where they're kind of gripping each other and then the Iguanodon is viciously stabbing it with its thumb spikes. I, I can't count the number of illustrations of this I've seen up to about 1995-ish. And it was just in every single kid's book ever. And it was Iguanodon used its thumb spikes to fight off predators. And it's a terrible idea. And I I think it's <laughs> extremely dodgy because as as a as a big iguanodon like if your only chance of fighting off a predator is getting into an arm lock with it you're kind <laughs> of a bit close to the whole big clawed hands and giant head full of teeth thing that's your first problem secondly we would look at them and go that's a really vicious thumb spike you know it's 10 centimeters long it might well have some 
horny covering to make it a bit long. You know, that's quite a nasty thing if it stabbed us. But if it stabbed a big seven, eight meter long predator, I mean, it would hurt, but it's not really going to do them too much damage. You know, this isn't something that you're going to be able to stick right through them. It's, it's not going to kill them. It's probably not even going to hurt them that much. So what's it for? My personal suspicion is that it, it very much is a weapon, but it's a weapon for fighting with other iguanodons rather than trying to deal with predators. I'm sure if a predator did bite them and they didn't have anything else, then yes, I, I, if I was an iguanodon, I would merrily stab them with, the, with my thumb spike because it might do some good. But the idea that that's why it evolved and that was its predominant role and the reason they had it, I think, is really ropey because we just don't see weapons like that in herbivore. I I can't think of anything that has that kind of one-off small weapon which is predominantly there as an anti-predator device. So if it's for other iguanodons then, is it a mating thing like antlers? Is it that sort of situation? I've written a huge amount of, of stuff on this. This is kind of my one key area of research, one of my, one of my biggest areas of research. There's this complex of behaviours which um, I usually refer to as sociosexual selection. So sexual selection is the classic thing that most people think of with peacocks with their big trains or antlers in deer or manes in lions or sea lions, the males being much bigger than females and, and everything like that. And it's about certain aspects of dominance and communication and being big and showing off in some way, shape or form to attract a mate or keep a mate. But it is very hard in the real world to actually separate that side of it from the social side of it. Because if you think about, um, say, a big antelope with big horns, Right, the big males with big horns, yeah, absolutely. The females find that attractive. And when he's looking to get hold of some females, he can beat up the other males because he's bigger and he's got big horns. But those horns are also going to be just as useful when food is running out because there's a drought and there's a fight over the last patch of trees. Or you're going for a drink and you want to be the one to drink the last bit of water at the watering hole. And that is a social side of those conflicts, which has nothing to do with sex. So I think it's incorrect to call it sexual selection, hence socio-sexual selection. And so pulling those two apart is hard in living species. Doing that in the fossil record, as you might imagine, becomes nigh on impossible. I don't, I can't think of anything obvious which we know is used in a social dominance context that isn't used sexually. So I think you have things like a peacock's train where they're absolutely using it to advertise to females, but I don't think it's ever really used for males to show off to each other to avoid them having a scrap. Right. I, m I might be wrong, but let's just take it as being that either way. And there's absolutely things where we know, like elephant tusks, where... Elephants use them for fights for sexual dominance, but also use them just generally to beat up other elephants. And <laughs> But that, that whole kind of just, you know, being in charge and, and kind of being the leader or getting, getting what you want. What I'm trying to picture now is the iguanodon on iguanodon combat. Because, the, I mean, surely, if no one's done it yet, at some point in the near future, someone's going to computer model this and try and figure out like what the moves are how an iguanodon takes an iguanodon down. Well, we know what the moves are. We know this. One, two, three, four. I declare a thumb war. <laughs> <laughs> so the way that they were always illustrated with this kind of very upright grappling with a predator, you know, like the way two sumo wrestlers come together and kind of force each other up. I think that probably is what they're doing and then just getting the thumb spikes in. And I, I spoke to um, a student I know who was who was looking at the huge amount of iguanodon material that's in Belgium and said, when you have a look, can you have a look at the ribs for me? Because you can imagine if they are doing this and stabbing each other, the one thing mm. they'll do sooner or later is hit ribs. And you yeah. might see healed wounds on ribs. Right. And so, so I was hoping for a little bit of a test to see if we could provide evidence of this. And of course, the flip side is also true. If they're fighting predators all the time, we should find predators with wounds on their ribs. Uh, the problem is we didn't find any. <laughs> Which doesn't mean they didn't do it, but 
it would have been nice if they if that showed up. And what about the semi opposable thumb? I mean, would that be a fighting tool? Could they like get each other in headlocks and and stuff? Well, it's it's it's, it's only their little finger, which is the the smallest and thinnest of the fingers, so it's really not going to do very much. All right. So what? So what's the little this unique gripping little finger which other dinosaurs don't have? What's that job? It's generally regarded as just being a way of holding food. Now the question becomes, how useful is that really? Because you look at modern herbivores and yes, obviously lots of monkeys will, will pull leaves and hold them and then eat them. But your average herbivore, deer, antelope, <laughs> uh, you know, Swear giraffe, on. rhino, hippos are, are not overly reliant on... <laughs> Squirrels do it. Well, that's the thing. Squirrels do do that, but without really an opposable thumb because they're holding something really quite big and they're holding it in the hands in the same way that a rat does as a raccoon does. But holding something in one hand um, and, and usually something relatively small and delicate, again, that doesn't really fit with their style of eating. They've got relatively big heads. They're eating big things. They're bulk feeders. Um, so I can see why people are sceptical that this grippy little finger exists because quite what is it actually holding and how would it be useful? Oh, I, I know what it's holding because I've seen uh, paintings in the kind of dinosaur books that I had as a small child in the 1970s where there's uh, a dinosaur in the foreground holding a branch, maybe even dropping a branch in surprise as they turn around and a meteorite's coming down from the sky. Yes. Um, <laughs> so the other reason that it's referred to is... So there's the famous panda's thumb because pandas have six fingers. Now, pandas don't have six fingers. What they actually have is a weirdly modified wrist bone, but it gives them the same kind of thing. It's an extra little thing that folds across the hand and is a little opposable digit. And they do use that for holding and pulling bamboo down while they're eating. Um, so that's probably the one example that we have of a relatively big herbivorous animal which does have some kind of hand gripping thing which we know it uses to hold branches to eat. But again, the difference I'd say there, and this is something that comes up with a few animals like this, is that a panda, if you think about it, okay, panda's a fairly big animal, but it's got, it's a short fat animal, let's be blunt, with a little neck and a relatively blunt head because it's a bear. Um, if it wants to reach, if there's something it can't reach with its head, it can reach out with its arm, which is longer and can reach far further forward than its head and its nose can. That's not true of things like Iguanodon. Their arms aren't that long and their necks and heads are. So if there's a branch that it can't reach with its head, it's not going to be able to reach it with its arm. And so that, re you know, and if it drops something, it's like, well, it just bends down and eats it. It doesn't have to pick it up and hold it kind of under its chest and then try and dip its head down to bite it. That's not very convenient. So if it's not using it for that and it's not using it to play games on its phone, <laughs> then it's 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 completely irrelevant then. It's just that it's a thing it... it it shouldn't have evolved. Well, so so this is the question. So the the I guess the first point is, does it really fold across the hand as much as some people have said it does? And that's why you're, the point you raised right at the start, you know, we want to look at the mechanics of this in detail. Just how far does the joint move? Just where are the muscles located? Can it pull it across? How strong might it be if it could pull it across? What what kind of strength would it have gripping something? Um, and so that, that, I think, is where that argument currently lies in the the people who've said actually i'm not sure this thing really does grip like that are saying that we've overinterpreted the joint and saying it's much more flexible and much stronger than it actually is could it be that they were eating something which required tools to get into it so for example some sort of nut or something that needed spiking open or cracking open so it needed the little finger to grip with and it needed the spike to stab with and it had to have the spike not stab itself so it's actually quite a skilled animal i was i was going to say i'm just i i know it doesn't work on the podcast for anyone watching this i'm watching izzy hold one hand up and then stab towards <laughs> the palm very hard and i'm like yeah. there's the obvious flaw in that plan <laughs> but but this this isn't totally mad crows do this kind of thing don't they crows use little little sticks as tools to get in things yeah they they absolutely do but they're they're holding things down on the ground with their feet r yeah. rather than but a, a guanodon could do that yes but then then what's the little grippy finger i for? think we're getting to the bottom of this now <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, th th this, is, this is the problem that you've always got with 
with the fossil record in general and and to a certain degree dinosaurs and older animals in particular if you know if you're looking at fossil mammals we've often got living relatives we can use as a model you know there's lots of very weird extinct elephants but at least we have modern elephants there's lots of weird extinct deer but we have modern deer you know there, there is no obvious iguanodon animal you know alive now and we 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 talked about plants a, a while back you know the, the, we don't have a great idea of plants and you know particularly things like fruit and nuts because fruit in particular doesn't preserve very well or or ever almost ever and so there's always these possibilities that there's something weird out there that we just haven't predicted and haven't thought of on the other hand as a hypothesis as a scientific hypothesis it's basically impossible to test you know you it becomes you've got to be very careful you don't end up with a just so story and go well there must have been a plant that happened to have a thing that it needed to hold with one hand and spike with its thumb and it's like well okay but then i'll say there were giant spiders back then that attacked their eggs and they had to hold it with their finger and spike it with their th- you you could dream up a million of these and none of them would be <laughs> any the more fun of it or less plausible than the others that's not science but it is fun uh did did you say did you say at the start that it's not called the iguanodon anymore so iguanodon was the i think second dinosaur ever named yeah and it was originally named off a bunch of teeth found in sussex by a guy called gideon mantell they then later found a big block with quite a few bones in it and then oh i want to say 40 50 years later there's this famous discovery in belgium in a mine where they found dozens of skeletons of what was also iguanodon and that's where actually if you go to many museums and you see a skeleton of iguanodon that's what it is it's either one of the actual belgium specimens or it's a copy of one of the belgium specimens and in the museum in brussels they've got like 20 of them in a row and so all these 20 animals came out of this single mine fast forward a century ish and it was eventually realized that these two things were distinctly different and therefore they should not both be called iguanodon and now I'm struggling to remember what the reasoning was, because usually whichever animal was named first keeps the name. Yeah. And it's the second one that changes. I think in this case, the problem would have been that the original Iguanodon was basically named off teeth. And now we yeah. know a whole bunch of other dinosaurs. They all have teeth that are basically indistinguishable. And so the original name bearing specimen, actually, you can't prove that it's truly Iguanodon. And therefore, that was the name that changed. So okay. now, so there is still one called an iguanodon. So there is still an animal called iguanodon, and it's Good. it's the Belgian one. Yeah, it's like Pink Floyd or Bucks Fizz. You know, it's it's a it's a big name dinosaur. It's one of the ones that gets on the posters. You you don't throw that name away. No, no. And then the British one, which was the original iguanodon, is now Mantellisaurus. So without naming names, because these are we professionals that you know, did this like become a fight? Not that bit in particular, but there has been an Iguanodon naming war over <laughs> a bunch of other bits of Iguanodons in the UK and Europe. So there's a whole bunch. So what you often get with, with, with dinosaurs, of course, is you don't get a whole good skeleton. So you've yeah. got an arm or you've got half a jaw or you've got a pelvis. And when you've got something like Iguanodon, where we've got 20, 30 good skeletons, and it's very easy, okay, we've probably got juveniles and adults and males and females, and we can see, oh, well, this one's got a couple more bones in its back, and this one's got a couple more teeth. We've got an idea of the variation. It then becomes really good as a kind of um, Rosetta Stone for comparing other things to it. And if they're different enough to that Rosetta Stone, well, then it's, it's probably new. But of course, these things are always, still always somewhat subjective. The, the very short version with the Iguanodon War really is that, I won't name names, though people who know know, um, a British researcher had spent a very long time and arguably far too long on his giant work checking and comparing and revising and sorting out basically every bit of Iguanodon known, in, sorry, Iguanodon tid, so all the related species in Europe. And an American researcher came along and quickly published several spe- papers going, and this is a new thing, and that's a new thing, and this is a new thing, and that one isn't. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I've been working on this for 20 years, and you knew I was working on this for 20 years. Should you really have done that without telling me when I'm months from finishing my work? 
<laughs> who who owns iguanodons? You just got to be first to the punch, surely. It's politeness, Auntie. We queue. This is Britain. But, but that's the thing that there's a, there's a genuine question hit there, and, and actually it's a, it's a real issue in some aspects of scientific research because you, you've got this comp- you've, you've got a problem, which is yeah. on the one hand you don't want people to be able to say. I'm working on that so no one else can. You know, that's yeah. almost, you know, monopoly, anti com- anti-competition, that is bad practice. On the flip side, you don't want someone, you don't want to be in this situation or, or worse situations where someone's put years or decades of work into a subject and then get gazumped by someone who rushes through the job deliberately to beat them to the punch and scoop them. I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of it. On the other hand, at the 10-year point, I'd have thought, let's get, let's get right, it out so, of it. So, <laughs> it, This wasn't you, was it? No, was this no, one of these no, stories? No, no, no <laughs> it, was, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, but, you know, there's a, there's a collegiality question there because you have got limited specimens. You know, if, if you want to work even on some very obscure, rare bird of paradise... Well, if I've got the money to go out to Papua New Guinea and study it, I can. And if someone else has got the money to go out and study it, they can. But with a lot mm. of the dinosaurs, there's one specimen. That's it. It's the yeah. only one in the world. So it's bad if it's kind of open season and everyone can do whatever they want because you're basically favouring the people who want to rush through and do a slapdash job and will yeah. try and be anti-collegiate and even still research. And there, there are incidents of that. There are people who give a scientific presentation at a conference and say, I think this is a new species and I'm working on it. And someone goes, oh, that's an interesting idea. I've seen that specimen. I've got some photos of it. And the next day a paper gets submitted, naming it. Right. Um, it's a cutthroat world. It really well, is. Well, right. And you do, but you don't want it to be because that's very yeah. bad for science. On the no. other hand, as you say, you don't want someone sitting on it forever. And, yeah. you know, most researchers work somewhere in between. You know, there, mm. there are... But this is... Isn't this what Darwin did, is he? If yeah. It, uh, he heard that... Was it, was it Wallace? Yeah. Alfred, Alfred Wallace, Wallace was yeah. going to put it out. And, it, and then he went, I better get out that evolution thing that I was working on. Well, they were actually in correspondence. They helped each other, didn't they? Yeah. So that, that one's a really interesting case in, in kind of science ethics. I use this when I, when I teach my first years about this. Darwin was working on a draft of what became Origin of Species. And he was kind of sat on it because he knew he was going to catch a lot of grief when he published it. And so he was trying to make his argument as watertight as he possibly could. Because he knew he was going to get backlash from basically everyone. Um, including like himself and his wife. Well, including his wife, <laughs> who was very religious. Yeah. And he, he saw the obvious anti-God connotations. And Wallace wrote, Wallace from the depths of Papua New Guinea, actually looking at Birds of Paradise, among other things, basically sent him a letter going, I've had this great idea for how evolution <laughs> might work. Um, so th- this, this, so th- this the people one always, guy he told was the one person he should have just done it himself, shouldn't he? And then, and then we'd have Wallace on banknotes. Well, so, so this is, but this is the story. So Darwin was then being the good collegiate scientist, didn't know what to do because he, he knew he'd been working on it for 20 years, but he also didn't want to stop Wallace because that's not his place. And Wallace is the other side of the world, which in the 1850s is a pretty big deal in terms of, I'll send him a letter to let him know what I think. It wouldn't get to him for six months, let alone the letter to come back again. And so Darwin confided in, it was Hooker and I think Lyle, and they basically, obviously without any of Wallace's knowledge, basically brokered a deal whereby they went to a a scientific meeting and presented a joint paper by Mm. Darwin and Wallace outlying the theory. Uh, The idea being that they get joint credit for the idea, but that then Darwin is free to get his book out safe in the knowledge that Wallace isn't going to find out for a while. And for the record, Wallace apparently was very happy with this when he found out. There was about 10, 15 years ago, there was a huge kind of, not anti-Darwin, but certainly pro-Wallace backlash of kind of, Wallace doesn't get the credit he deserves. It's really unfair that Darwin gets all the credit and Wallace deserves just as much credit. Wallace himself said he didn't think that was the case. um, Right, okay. Because he said that Darwin had done all the, all, all Wallace had was an idea. Wallace had the outline in the sense of there is competition and inheritance of traits and only certain traits survive and that's how things change. But that was about the limit of it. Darwin had chapters and chapters and chapters of his book written on the underlying theory and how it would work and potential examples and contradictions and stuff that needed, you know, and had thought through everything. 
And Wallace recognised this and said he'd had a flash of insight and worked out only the most bare bones of it. And Darwin had done everything and decades before him. So Wallace was really not unhappy with the idea that Darwin got most of the credit and that he was allowed right. to be in the mix. And also probably happy he didn't get completely gazumped. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and then Wallace himself basically founded the field of biogeography and created the Wallace line. So Wallace is entirely famous as a biologist in his own right. Yeah, and he got a working trip to East Asia. He was, he was doing fine. Well, so Wallace was poor in a way that Darwin wasn't. And so Wallace made his money as a, as a specimen collector, which was a, obviously a big deal for the Victorians. And he started off, I think, in Brazil, certainly in South America, and then spent like five years in South America collecting, <laughs> you know, skins and skulls and plants and seeds. And it all got put on a ship back to Britain and sank, and he lost everything. Um, and so he basically had to start again and ended up in... Malaysia and yeah was largely responsible for some of the first birds of paradise coming back to the UK you know yes obviously the indigenous people knew about that but you know this was the discovery of birds of paradise was was Wallace but that's also what led to have, have either of you heard of the Wallace line because I threw that out a minute ago no, and it might be meaningless no. so if you if you go to Indonesia and that giant chain of islands that basically goes from you know Thailand all the way down to Australia Wallace noted, flitting between all the islands, is that there's not just species, but whole groups of animals and plants that are on one island that aren't on another. Now, on the one hand, this kind of makes sense. But what he, he spotted was things like tree kangaroos, which are obviously Australasian in origin because they're kangaroos. And they just stop dead at this line. And so do cassowaries. And then on the other side, you have completely different animals like clouded leopards and leopards and uh, tapirs and orangutans that don't get to the other side. And in particular, things like birds, which of course can fly very easily between islands. In some cases, these islands are like 20 miles apart, which in the grand scheme of things is nothing. And yet they just stop dead. And what he realised is that this was probably due to their separate origins. That one lot of this fauna came from Asia and had spread south, and the other lot had come from Australia and had spread north. And what this ultimately tied into was plate tectonics. This is the moving continents and the origins of these islands that meant that these animals ran into each other and they'd adapted locally and therefore couldn't spread across that line. The line that he created, which was the Wallace line, so he basically drew a line on a map between islands, showed where the things didn't cross. And that showed you something about the evolutionary and ecological ancestry of these groups. And he spotted this because of the different species across islands. It's really, really cool stuff. So there we have it. The next time you give a thumbs up, just remember. Um, I, I Personally, actually, I think that they were just using it as a kebab. That that would be it. They've got their lovely thumb spike and they're going, hey, ladies, look how many bananas I can... Actually, they wouldn't have had bananas. Damn, that's that's ruined my entire theory. I was, I was thinking of chicken ticker, actually, and just like, skewing a little bit. They're more likely to have chicken ticker than they would have banana, I think. I think but chickens are before bananas in the evolutionary history. <laughs> <laughs> I also think that all of our bananas are clones, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yeah. And weirdly, Iceland grows a lot of them. That I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the largest exporters of bananas is Iceland because they use the thermal vents to heat their greenhouses. Well, that's what I was going to assume once you'd said it. That's very cool. Anyway, this isn't about dinosaurs. We should do a podcast about bananas, shouldn't we? What I didn't ask you at the very beginning, which I should have done, did they have feathers? Are these a feathered type of, or are they very... No, so so we've got at least a few with skin um, and... And typical small scales, just like the hadrosaurs. Um, I don't think there's any particular reason to think that any of the... As, as usual, you know, these days you've got to say, who knows, because we've got some filaments in some not-too-distant relatives. Can we just, can we just say, but take it as red. Dave will talk about current evidence. Take it as red. <laughs> who knows, some of them wore uh, hoodies with zippers. Um <laughs> <laughs> if you can prove It'd be that, good for a zipper, a wouldn't it? Be good for a zipper. Hook your zipper. Yeah. <laughs> Just trying to find a use for this thumb get, spike. Get a little loop at the end. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> until next week. Rawr, rawr. Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast with Izzy Lawrence and Dr. Dave Hone. This episode was only made possible thanks to our patrons on Patreon and for listeners like you who share our content with your friends. So please spread the word on social media. You can find us on Patreon, Facebook, 
and at ISZI underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and at D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E on Twitter. Include the hashtag Terrible Lizards. Ask us your questions via terriblelizards.co.uk, email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. We are hoping to bring you so much more, but we can only do that if our audience continues to grow. So please like, share and subscribe.